Welcome to Science with Susanna. The purpose of this video is to give you a quick review of the endocrine system or an introduction to it if you've never heard of it. So um, the endocrine system uh, means inside growth and it is composed of the organs in your body that make hormones. We're going to represent hormones in this video with green dots. So we'll put some in this cell over here. These could be um, the hormones that are chemical messengers that travel in the bloodstream. I'm going to use a black pen for this. So hormones are chemical messengers that travel in the bloodstream. So then we can take um, our green pen again and put some of those in this blood vessel here. We can remind ourselves that it's a blood vessel by making it pink. So this represents a blood vessel and the green dots represents the, represent the hormones traveling. Then you can use a green highlighter to show that cells in your body make hormones, different kinds of hormones, and then those hormones are released into the bloodstream and then from there they go to target cells. Now I have two different pathways here because sometimes the target cells have receptors on their outside and sometimes the receptors inside the cell. So the hormones will then when they reach their target they can bind to a receptor on the outside of a cell or on the inside of the cell. So I used a green dot to represent that. Uh, you can show the hormones coming out of the blood like this going over. And what's cool about some hormones, like steroid hormones, they can diffuse straight through the cell membrane like that because they're nonpolar. So I always like to make my receptors orange. So let's color this receptor orange and this receptor orange. And then let's label these. This um, is a cell membrane receptor. And this one is an intracellular receptor. And both of these are what we call a target cell. So a hormone can only influence a cell if it has receptors on it or inside of it. Steroid hormones are able to go inside to bind because they are nonpolar. So steroid hormones are, for example, estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, cortisol, and aldosterone. And also thyroxin, uh, sometimes you've heard of that as just a thyroid hormone, but these ones get to go inside. And then the other kinds of hormones are what we call amino acid based. So they either are a protein or they're derived from a protein or they're just a few amino acids. Um, so amino acid based hormones. These ones are polar and or you might also have learned the word hydrophilic. So because of that, they don't diffuse through the membrane and they have to bind to a receptor on the outside of the cell. Um, just a, one comment about sensitivity. If we say that a cell is very sensitive to a hormone, usually what that means is that there are many receptors on the surface. So if a cell is sensitive, like if it's sensitive to insulin, then it will have a lot of receptors to insulin. If it is resistant, it will have fewer. Okay, so then I wanted to go back over here to this cell that was originally making the hormones. So these green dots represent hormones. And I want to remind you something that endocrine organs are not. And that is that they are not exocrine. So um, right here, let's draw a skin or um, mucous membrane. That's what this represents. So cells that make exocrine products, why don't we put those um, in yellow? So they might make 
uh, something like saliva or digestive enzymes. And those are secreted through a duct and onto a membrane. So exocrine glands send their products down a duct, which is a, just a tube, and that's what this represents, onto a membrane. And your skin is considered a membrane, a cutaneous membrane, or maybe the mucous membrane, like your GI tract. So some examples of exocrine products would be sweat, tears, digestive enzymes, that go into the stomach and the intestine, mucus. These are all examples of exocrine. And I, I want to focus on endocrine in this video, but it's hard to um, avoid making sure that you guys know the difference here. I see this so often on standardized exams where they expect students to know that exocrine glands release their products onto a membrane of some kind and that they have ducts, whereas exocrine, or sorry, endocrine glands, so hormones, do not have ducts, and they release their products into the bloodstream. So there's a little review of that, which I feel certain will come in handy for you at some point in your education, knowing the difference between these. And some organs can be both, right? Like the pancreas makes all your digestive enzymes, but it also makes insulin. Okay, so um, now let's go ahead and look at, very quickly, some different kinds of hormones. Now I have a couple other, several other videos actually that go into more detail, but what I wanted to do here was give you an overview. If you're studying for the T's exam or you just wanna freshen up or you just wanna find some themes with hormones, I really think you might find this helpful. So um, let's go down here and I've drawn a blood vessel so here's a blood vessel. And I found that you can group a lot of these according to if they make something become more plentiful in the blood or less plentiful in the blood. So watch this, this is kind of cool. We're going to use um, a blue pen to name all the hormones uh, we talk about in this blood vessel. And then we'll use um, purple for making something more plentiful, uh, like this. Look at all, and this one, whoop, whoop. And this one, just half of it, and then whoop. Okay, so, and then some things we're gonna talk about also decreasing. So why don't I use blue for that? Okay, ready to go on this? So this, you might recognize as a um, little sketch of glucose. So this is representing um, blood sugar. And when we say blood sugar, we essentially always mean blood glucose because you don't really measure fructose in the blood. Okay, so the, and then let's get your blue pen. The hormone that makes blood sugar go up is called glucagon and it comes out of the pancreas and it causes the liver to make blood sugar go up. The pancreas also makes insulin and that makes blood sugar go down. So glucagon makes blood sugar go up, insulin makes blood sugar go down in the blood. Okay, now let's look at calcium. Calcium is stored in your bones and so if you um, need more calcium in your blood, then parathyroid hormone stimulates your bones to break down and calcium goes up in the blood. So this is called parathyroid hormone. This is another one that I see on standardized exams all the time. They really like you to know that PTH makes your blood calcium go up. And then there is another less discussed hormone called calcitonin that comes out of your thyroid gland and it makes blood calcium go down. I don't see that one come up too often in the literature, but I didn't want to completely skip it on this overview. Okay, then these are red blood cells. And when you make 
there be more red blood cells, then you're going to be able to carry more oxygen. The hormone that does that comes out of the kidney, and it's called erythropoietin, which means red formation, or EPO. This one's been implicated in um, blood doping because if people inject it, they can make their red blood cells go up um, exceptionally high. And so then this person can carry more oxygen. Okay, so erythropoietin makes red blood cells go up in the blood because it stimulates red blood cell formation um, from the bone marrow. Okay, next I'd like to talk about water. You're going to make there be more water in the blood with the hormone antidiuretic hormone. This hormone is made in the um, brain and then it is affects the kidneys and it makes the kidneys reabsorb more water. So, wa oh, sorry, so water goes up in the blood. And that's going to increase blood volume and can then indirectly increase blood pressure. Okay, similarly then, the next um, blood measurement we'll look at is increasing sodium in the blood. And the hormone that does that is aldosterone. Aldosterone is a steroid hormone that comes out of the kidney. And... Um, its nickname is Aldo, and aldosterone makes your kidneys hang on to more sodium, and by doing that, water follows salt, and then you get more blood volume in your blood vessels, and then that can indirectly raise blood pressure. Notice I have a downward arrow on this one too, and those are hormones called natriuretic peptides. And the natriuretic peptides are released uh, mostly from the heart itself when it's when pressure is a little bit high in the heart. And you see the root word natrio here. That means salt. And so these are going to make your kidneys lose salt. So natriuretic peptides make your kidneys lose salt so that blood volume goes down. And aldosterone makes your kidneys hang on to salt and that makes your blood volume go up. Okay, and then last, um, just a grouping of some blood vessels that make blood, or sorry, some hormones that make blood pressure go up. Epinephrine or adrenaline is the one people are usually most familiar with. Epinephrine directly makes blood vessels constrict and blood pressure go up. Similarly, angiotensin II makes blood pressure go up directly by constricting blood vessels. Angiotensin II also stimulates more release of aldosterone and more release of antidiuretic hormone, and in so doing, it all, it's a very pot potent raiser of blood pressure. Um, and then you could say that blood pressure is decreased then by natriuretic pep peptides as well, so you could put this in both categories if you wanted. Then, when I was about done with my sketch, I realized, oh my goodness, I forgot my favorite hormone, which is cortisol. So cortisol, a steroid hormone from the adrenal medulla, makes inflammation go down. Cortisol is also very important at increasing the availability of, um, it actually increases blood glucose and it increases um, fat breakdown. So I like to think of it as your stress hormone or mobilizing energy. So to recap then, cortisol makes um, inflammation go down during times of stress. And um, so it inhibits the immune system and it makes blood glucose and fat breakdown go up. And I have a whole video about um, the adrenal hormones that you can watch if you want to know more about that. Okay, then just a few more to talk about here. Uh, sexual ma maturity and reproduction are controlled by um, the st some steroid hormones and pituitary gland um, hormones. So you've got a hormone called FSH and LH, and those stand for follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. And these help to regulate estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone in males, in the testes. And in so doing, they control the development of sperm and of eggs 
and the you know, increasing the thickening of the lining of the uterus, um, as well as maintaining secondary sex characteristics so that uh, reproduction can be successful. So this is actually one, two, three, four, five hormones here that are all implicated in sexual maturity and reproduction. Then over here, um, this is mammary glands development. Milk production and release is under the control of two important hormones, prolactin, and they're both from the pituitary gland, prolactin, and then oxytocin that's stored in the pituitary gland. These two hormones help um, during pregnancy the mammary glands develop and begin producing milk, and then oxytocin actually allows the milk to be released when the baby is nursing. Last hormone I'd like to discuss is a growth hormone, and growth hormone is important for helping kids grow, of course, so their bones get longer, their muscles get stronger, but then throughout our life, even once we've reached our adult size, a repair, oh, I should add that here, a cell repair is critical and m muscle maintenance and all of that sort of stuff is stimulated by growth hormone. Well, there you have it, just a few minutes. Um, you can find the drawing notes and practice questions at sciencewithsusanna.com. And also in this playlist for the endocrine system, you can find, and on my website, you can find other videos on the endocrine system that go into a little more detail on virtually all of these hormones.